Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Isa. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Isa. Wow, what an honor to be here. There's so many people. Um, like Trisha said, she's been my friend for a long time, so we've been back and forth torturing each other, like asking each other to do open talks on stuff like that. Um, let's see here. I'll start from the beginning. Um, I should start with, I qualify for many programs, and I'll say that because I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, family disease that I have. Um, let's see here. I'm the eldest of six. Um, I grew up in mostly Lansing, but all over Michigan. Um, my mom was here and my dad was in California, so I bounced around a lot, but I was raised mostly by my mother. Um, during that process, I think I went to something like 10 different schools. Um, there wasn't a lot of stability in my life. And as, from what I figure, it's pretty important to have that to um, understand what that should look like or feel like uh, security. It's a big thing, an important thing. Um, I told myself I wasn't going to get up here and like trauma mom <laughs> with everybody. But my story, um, it's actually changed in uh, my perception of my childhood has changed a lot as I've grown in this program. So I think initially I saw it as this traumatic, terrible thing that happened to me. And as I heal, I realize that it is a part of what made me who I am today, and I would not change a thing about it. That being said, I I did experience quite a bit of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse. I only bring that up because I think it's important for me to mention because that was kind of the ground uh, line for the way I felt about myself. It was my introduction into shame. I was too young to understand that I was not the problem, that something bad had happened to me, that I was not a bad kid or person or human or whatever that is. And I held on to that belief for a very long time. Um, I tried to hide it from everybody. Um, Part of growing up, back and forth and all over the place, and being the eldest of six uh, is a lot of fighting. (laughs) Wherever we went, like, that's how I made sure, like, my sisters and brothers were safe. And I could do that for them, because I was a badass. And um, I held that belief, and that's kind of how I made uh, my way through most of my childhood. I also wanted to add that um, there was a lot of fun in that. Uh, Not the beating people up, but, like, my childhood. Um, I did have all of these experiences. Uh, my mom tried really hard. She was a single mom. Um, unfortunately, she was teaching or showing me what she had been shown or trying to teach me something she had never known how to do. And um, I thank her deeply for that. Uh, I was with her today, actually, and my sister yesterday, so it's kind of hard to talk about all this stuff. Um, let's see here. When I was about 13, I started getting really out of hand. My, uh, a, my disease had kind of manifested in the sense that I was always looking for fun, whatever that was. I needed to be a part of it, you know. And my mom could not control me. She had other kids to raise, and she sent me out to live with my dad. Um, I didn't really know him at that point. Uh, most of my childhood, I believe he was in prison. I, I don't have a lot of clear answers. I did uh, talk to my stepmom recently and learn a little bit more about him. Um, He came to me in a dream right around Christmas time, and I was like, I think that I need to ask some questions. I don't know why, but um, I was led to. Uh, I found out that he was in prison or jail or whatever that was um, for a drunk driving accident where he uh, was the driver and the passenger Uh, was paralyzed and um and that's the funny thing like I just found out about this uh what a month ago 
You know, so that's another thing about my family. We're really good with secrets. So you you put shame and then you put a secret on top of it because we don't talk about that stuff, right? And then you get up in front of 100 people and you talk about it all. I don't know how that works, but it does. Um, when I got out there, I, that's when it really started uh, being pretty crazy. California's a lot faster than Michigan. I don't know how to explain it, but... Um, and I thought it was cool. I found the right friends that understood me and took me to parties and um, smoked weed with me and all that fun stuff. And I got to embrace the Latina in me. And I was a little cholita, and I wouldn't fight anybody. And um, I loved that part of it. And I think I lasted about a year and a half there before my behavior got out of control for my dad, too. Imagine that. Um, my mom came and got me, and I came back to Michigan. And, and the same stuff kept happening. I could find trouble no matter where I was, and I loved it. Um, eventually, I guess my mom tried really hard to have some normalcy in our life, and uh, she ended up getting married to somebody who um, took care of her, and she needed help, I think. I, I still think she needs help. <laughs> That's not at all. Um, <laughs> So we moved here to Mason. I'd never experienced anything like it. So up to this point, I was like in house parties. I was in crazy neighborhoods. I was experiencing all of these things. And I came here, and it was so boring. <laughs> you know, like I would go to parties in cornfields. I'm like, how should I? I was like, I can't live like this. Um, but I found my people here too. They're here too. Go figure. Um, one of them being Trisha, who I got to introduce me today. Um, and out and conjuring and doing those things. Um, I had a lot of fun. Um, let's see. I had my son when I was 17 years old. So I got pregnant when I was 16. I kind of dropped out of school. Had a kid, two kids. I mean, that's what we do. Um, grow up too fast. That's what I did anyway. I grew up way too fast. Um, and another, when I was thinking about it, um, I drive, I was driving here, and it took a few hours to get here. And I was taking that time to like pray and center myself and think about what I was going to say. And I had all of these little epiphanies about what my life was like. And I remember I had my son really young, and I had no idea how to parent. I was terrified out of my mind. I still believed that I was... Uh, a mistake and a bad person, and I didn't want to put that on him. Um, so I ran away from him and that. I gave him to my mom to raise. He was probably about four or five years at that point. Um, during the time that I did have him, I was the best mom that I could be. I loved him a ton, um, but I still went out and drank and passed out and had other people and basically raised him, even when he was in my own home. Um, but that was another awareness for me. It's like the manifestation of the disease, the self-centeredness of how I behaved. Like everything yeah. was about me. Like, um, the way I felt, uh, the way I saw the world, it was through this distorted view of myself and my experiences and uh, my fear, mostly. Um, I took that time, went out to Colorado, had a on life, lived, went different places, did things, um, left my son with my mom, and about two years or three years into that, um, I found out that my son's father had died, and I remember being in Colorado and being like, well, shit, my kid, an orphan now, you know, like, I, I couldn't lie to myself anymore about that, I was like, I need to get back and start taking care of this person that I made. And I came back and um, didn't know what the hell I was doing. My son was completely off the rails because he had never known me, really, or rules or any of those things. And um, I worked really hard to establish a healthy life or what I thought would be uh, what I should uh, do for him. And I got a job and I got the little... I got two jobs, two jobs, and um, built a life up. But I still would. I was. I would like to consider myself a, a binge drinker at that point. 
So up until this point in my life, I would consume anything put in front of me in moderate, not in moderation, in a party all night. But then the next day I'd get up and go to work and I was okay. You know, and, and I surrounded myself by pe- with people who did the same thing. And it seemed really normal to, um, I don't know, all the stuff I did. Um, and I kept that up for a while, and I did pretty good at it. Um, and I started getting grounded. My son started trusting me again. Um, and I had my life pretty balanced. And I had turned about 30. <laughs> 30. I decided that um, I was going to get healthy. Because I was getting so low. Oh, yeah. And I started working out all the time. And I was eating really healthy. And I was doing all of these things that I needed to do. And my life was so great. And it was, everything was speeding up. Um, I don't really know how to explain it. I didn't even recognize when it was happening. Um, I started getting these like, crazy thoughts. I'm like, I need to quit my job and put all my things in a storage unit. And because I'm going to move across the state for Kalamazoo Promise. And my son will have free college. And uh, mind you, I'm completely sober at this time because I'm getting healthy, right? So I stopped drinking, I stopped doing drugs, I stopped doing everything. Uh, Working out was my obsession. And um, I just kept going, kept going. And at some point, I just lost complete connection to reality. And looking back on that, you know, I don't know. I was diagnosed with all sorts of crazy shit, like, Bipolar, schizophrenic, blah, blah, blah. Um, when I'm telling you that I was losing my mind, I <laughs> I had auditory uh, hallucinations. I didn't know up from down. I remember at one point, um, does anybody know where CMH is? We're <laughs> 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 connected to the VHS on Jolly's here. So uh, I was taken there one day, and I had this idea that like I was going to dissolve. And um, I was taken there because I needed some help, but I didn't know that. I was trying to save everybody. So my great idea was that <laughs> that um, I was going to take off all my clothes. Most of my stories start with, I'm going to take off all my clothes and um, jump in a dumpster so that I don't uh, dissolve into the groundwater and infect everyone in insanity. And this is the fun part about going crazy. At least it was for me. I remember every crazy thought, thing, experience I had during that time in my life. And that particular experience got me put into a state mental hospital. (laughs) And I was there for a minute, Um, quite a few minutes. They were deciding whether they were going to keep me for a year or however long. Um, And they were putting me on a lot of heavy medication. And um, they gave me an option to fight it in an attorney. And mind you, I'm still pretty crazy at that point. So I didn't really know what was going on, but I knew that my son needed me. So I had to get out of here and and get better again. And so I was like, got the attorney, fought it. They were like, okay, you can leave here, but you have to take all this medication in order to be out. And I did. No problem. Sure, I'll do whatever you want. The problem was that when I got out, the medication made me feel basically like I was swimming underwater all the time. It didn't take the crazy away. It just took my ability to act crazy away. And I think that's what medication does, right? I mean, that's what it did for me. Let me put it that way. So um, I was trying to rebuild my life. And I was on so much medication, I could barely hold my head up most of the time. And I had to work, and I had to make money. So I was like, oh, I'm going to stop taking um, I stopped going to my appointments. I don't really know how that worked out since I was basically court ordered to, but um, it's really easy to fall through the cracks if you're like trying to <laughs> avoid things. It, it can happen. Um, but I still had the disease or whatever it was, a spiritual awakening, mental breakdown, whatever, and um, didn't know how to cope with it. And I turned to what had always been a comfort to me, and that was um, pills. I tried alcohol, but... Um, I needed to consume so much all the time that I couldn't function. I was one of those fun alcoholics. Like I would get, uh, what do they call it, binge drinking, blind drunk. I'd crash cars. I'd do terrible things. I just couldn't keep a job and drink at the same time. It just wasn't in my DNA. Um, but pills, you could take a few of them, go to work, blah, blah, blah. 
And I kept doing that for a while. And as I did that, they became harder to find. Um, at some point, I remember I couldn't get them, and I and I felt really sick. And I was like, oh, I have the flu. This is terrible. Um, it turns out I did not have the flu. I had developed some sort of addiction, whatever that is. And um, my body really needed these things. Um, I couldn't afford it anymore, and it just got worse and worse and worse. So, of course, as I'm sure many people can relate, um, I moved on to other substances. And as that happened, um, my life became more and more chaotic. Um, it basically fell away. I stopped taking care of my son again um, and started being, I guess, homeless. I kept it up for a little while. I could keep my bills paid and stuff, but at some point, I just couldn't do it anymore. And uh, that's when the real fun started happening. Um, I have so many stories in that time, and <laughs> I try not to bring open talks. I don't know how the best time to like, really tell you guys everything that happened, but um, an example of the insanity for me. I decided I wanted to get clean. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I went to uh, a detox center. And I'm like, I'm going to get well. This is going to work for me because I want to be a mom. I need to be a mom. And I went there, and there was this lady. She kept telling me, come, let's go. You don't have to feel this like this. And I'm like, no, 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 I, I really need to be here. I, I want to be a mom. And, um, and it, you... I think you only have to ask me three times before I say yes to almost anything. And um, so I left. I left with her, and she was, and I was driving. I, at this point, I was living in my car, which is pretty highfalutin. I mean, I didn't realize it at that time, but like I had transportation, I had somewhere to sleep, I had somewhere to keep all my stuff, and um, we left. I'm driving. You know, I was so sick, and she was like, "Here, take this." And I was driving, and she poured a bunch of pills in my hand, and I looked over, and I was like. By that time, I'm pretty well acquainted to this kind of thing. I'm like, I don't recognize those. Oh, well. Huh. And I took a whole handful. And at some point, I was like, oh, I'm getting really tired. I don't feel hot. I feel like shit, and I'm tired. And it got so bad uh, that I had to pull over so she could drive. And, it, and then I lost consciousness, I guess. And um, I woke up in a hospital room with no shirt on again, no clothes on, and a bunch of these stickers all over. And I was hooked up to this machine, and the nurses and everybody were freaking out, and they were like, you almost, you almost died. Do you realize what just happened to you? And apparently, what she had given me was Catapress, which is a blood pressure medication, and it dropped my blood pressure so low that essentially I'm dying, I was shutting down, and I didn't know that. Um, and the nurses were like, you're really lucky that she dropped you off at a hospital and didn't leave you in a park because you'd be dead. And all I was concerned about was that bitch stole my home. And uh, what am I going to do now? Where am I going to go? Now I don't have anywhere to sleep. I better roll back to detox. And I went there, and I stayed okay for maybe three months, something like that. Um, and that lasted for, I think, four more years. It only got worse. <laughs> And I would constantly try to get well. And I think at one point, I decided detox wasn't enough. I was going to go to treatment. Um, that fixed me up. And <laughs> I went to treatment, and um, I brought all of my distorted thinking and self-centeredness and uh, all that fun stuff with me. And I... Uh, threw my ass around, and nothing was good enough, and they didn't understand, but I did make it to my first meeting. That is what treatment was good for for me. I made it to a meeting. And I remember thinking, what the hell cult is this? <laughs> Everybody's trying to touch me, and um, they are all old, and they drink a lot of fucking alcohol, and ugh, gross. And that's really what I thought. And um, so I didn't last very long. I got a treatment, went right back out, and I would go through these cycles. I'd be like, on a roll, or on a run, or whatever you call it, for months at a time. Then I would um, decide I needed a break. That's what I'd 
considered it at this point. I would always tell myself, I want to get well, but I wasn't willing to do anything to get well except for go to a treatment center, detox, and then get back out. Um, and it was a never-ending cycle. During this time, um, I no longer had a house in my car. <laughs> Um, it was insane because I was working as a waitress at Zeus's, I don't know, they closed down, I heard, which breaks my heart. But, um, and I would go in there with all my clothes in an Aldi's bag, and all my clothes, I'm talking about pajamas, because if I had my work clothes on, that's my only daytime clothes, and then otherwise I just had on whatever I could find in all of my toiletries, and I'd go to work, and I'd put it in the back room, and I would pretend like, ah, I was okay I actually believed that shit. And I thank God for those other beings because they kept me employed for three years and they should not have. I remember one time going to take an order and pulling my pen out and I was a syringe. Let me take your order. <laughs> and they knew about that. And they would sit me down and I'd be like, you know, we believe that you can get, that you're worth this. And I'd be like, you're out, you're out of here. I'm not, I'm not, like you, if you don't, you don't know, because you don't know what I've done, and you don't know what I've seen, and you have no idea, and I, I loved that, you know, that terminally unique and all that fun stuff, nobody could understand how I was. Uh, my friend Trisha would go in, because she could always, you could never find where I was, because sometimes I'd be sleeping in a laundromat, and sometimes I'd come up with enough money to stay in a hotel, and sometimes I'd be at a friend's house. It, it, all of these different things, but she could find me at work. I was pretty consistent with work, which is crazy to think about, honestly. Uh, well, I needed money, and I didn't. I wasn't too good at tricking. I just wasn't. Um, and so she would come in, and she'd be like, you need to get well. I'm taking you home. And she would let me detox on her couch and be around her babies. And um, sometimes it would last, and then sometimes I'd go right back out. Um, but part of the Trisha detox program was always like, you don't need dope, let's drink alcohol. <laughs> so much class here. God bless your soul. And um, at, at, at some point during this, I went to treatment again. Um, and I got out, and I was like, I'm going to take this series. I'm going to move to Silver Living. And I went to the Silver Living house, and I started going to meetings. And I don't know if it was required, but I started going to meetings. I was getting more desperate, basically. And um, I went into the East Club, and I was like, oh, this is familiar. There's a bar over there. I know where to go. <laughs> I walked right up, and I was like, I don't know anything about this, but I need a sponsor. You know, in the bar, that, that, I don't think that's what that lady was there for. <laughs> and she goes, hold, hold on. This woman walked through the door, and she goes, hey, Margie, come over here. This this girl needs a sponsor. And she was like, fuck. And, um, <laughs> but she did what we do, you know, and she said, come here. Let me explain what I need you to do in order for me to be your sponsor. And she did all those things. Like, I had to meet her there daily to read. I could barely read the big book. I mean, it's hard enough for me to read it now. But when I was early in recovery, like, I couldn't pronounce half the words. That was also part of my homework. I had to take a highlighter and highlight the words I didn't know so we could go back over it and how, what it meant in the context of the story. Uh, it was a lot. But I, uh, I managed to start working the steps. I also managed to continue lying. And here's the thing. Step one requires a lot of honesty. Um, it's one thing to be honest to other people. It's a whole different animal when you start being honest to yourself, right? So I'm, I'm telling myself, I'm not using drugs. I'm fine. Um, but I'm going to make my mom some wheat cookies, and I need to eat one to make sure they're good. And, um, and I would do that, and then I'd go and get a coin, you know? And, and I would feel like a POS, because I'm sitting here putting coins in my pocket and eating weed cookies and hanging out with all this dope stuff, because that's what I still knew, in one foot in, one foot out. But I managed to string around... Um, Nine months, and for me, that was the longest I'd ever gone since I could remember. 
like really since I was a child, without using. And um, I did not stay clean, but I did get indoctrinated. <laughs> I started to understand. I started to see. And once you see, you cannot unsee. You know, even if you're not honest with yourself, that it creeps in. It creeps in the cracks, you know, no matter how much you avoid it. Um, and I held that recovery, those steps, that knowledge, in, I want to say the back of my mind, but it was like somewhere in my belly. It, was, it just was with me and I hurt because I didn't know better. And I continued going out another few years, a few years. It got worse and worse and worse. Uh, during this time, I have no idea where my son is. I feel like I'm doing him a favor by never talking to him, um, or my family, or anybody else for that matter. I hated myself. I remember I was still at Zeus's and I was working, and a table of people from the program came in. Um, I didn't work morning, so I didn't like morning. So they were usually morning people, but they came in on an afternoon, and I was like, fuck. I, didn't, I could not hide from them. They were in my section, even. I was like, oh my god, I, I, I paid another waitress to take care of this table because I did not want them to look me in the eyes. I, had, I, was, a, I was so ashamed. There, there goes that shame thing again. Do you think that anybody that was sitting at the table would have been mean to me? Fuck no. They would have hugged me and they would have welcomed me and they would have asked me how I was doing and they would have meant it. But I was terrified of that. I didn't want to um, let anybody in. Uh, that would not be... It would make the lie harder. So all of this avoidance and everything was really easy for me. And um, at some point, I got word that uh, my son was eating. And I hated myself. I could not get clean for myself. I tried a million times. And I heard he was using, and I thought about him being in the situations that I was in. And it terrified me. It scared me. Um, I probably stayed out for another month after that, but I hated my life. And I thought about him every second. And I remember I was in this place. Uh, it wasn't even a spot. I don't even know. It was a trailer. It's not happy. It was really weird. This guy was um, mad because he thought I had dope, which I did, but I told him I did not. And he was, like, throwing heavy things at me. And I came with a friend, and she was passed out drunk, and I couldn't get her off the floor to get her to the car. And um, I was just, it, it was too much. And I, I stood in the middle of this place, and I go, I'm powerless over my addiction. My life's unmanageable. And I was still using. But I'm a firm believer that the first step can be said and meant and felt while you're still in it. If you've been exposed to it and you know, because all it is is honesty, right? So all of a sudden I got really honest with myself. I'm like, I can't fucking do that. I was terrified. I was like, ah, get me out of here. And I said it and I heard it and I was in detox like a week later. Um, I wanted it this time. Not for me. Not for me. And, and people will say that. Oh, you can't, you can't do it for yourself. It can't be an outside and it has to be for you. Bullshit. Because <laughs> I did it for him. Because I hated myself. But here's the thing. You could do it for someone else. But if you're doing it right, it starts to be for you. And that was my experience. All of a sudden I started like loving myself. Or, well, I don't want to go that far. But uh, I started appreciating life again. Um, so I get up here to treatment. And, you know, I've been to treatment and detox so many times. So when they were going through the list, they were, like, naming off, obviously, I'm like, I'm not going to the glass house. And my adult, I know, I know people in my neighborhood, I'm getting out of here. F Lansing, excuse me, I love Lansing, but, you know, that's how I felt. And I needed as far away from it as possible. And they were like, well, there's a treatment center in LP. And I was like, I've never heard of that. Send me there. <laughs> and I went there. And mind you, like, I still only had my Aldi's bag. Uh, I didn't have shit. All my bridges were burned. Even the people that loved me, 
I didn't really know how to look at them because of all of the grimy stuff I did and, and to them and, you know, and not even telling them um, at that point. And so I go there and I am depressed. I remember um, sitting in this chair in treatment and this counselor is like, I was like, in a, you know how you do when you got a blanket on, and you know, like my head was down, and I was like barely participating, and she was like, do you even want to live? And I was like, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. And um, it was like I was giving up or something, but I was still just hanging on to that. My life was unmanageable, you know? I was hanging on, and I'm like, I can't go back. So I stuck around for a while, and I got... Well, er, you know, um, as well as you can. I could walk. I came in, let me say this, I came in with an abscess in my, in my legs. I couldn't walk. They had to put me on IV. I was, in the, I was near death. My body was. Um, my soul, I think, had already died at that, at that point. And so I used treatment to get physically well. And um, I already had some, you know, AA stuff and knowledge and, you know, I just want to say, since my story is so all around the world about this, um, I am so grateful that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Because I don't want to drink. I don't want to drink. Um, and we all belong here because we're human beings that don't want to drink and need to live. And um, I needed to hold on to that because I got into this program up there and it was even more different. People were even older and whiter. And um, I, I didn't have much understanding of what to do and I was afraid of everybody and I was pretty sure they hated me, and, but I kept going, you know, because what was I going to go back to? And um, I would go to meetings and I developed this foundation and I found this sponsor who was amazing and I picked her because I was out of treatment at this point. I was staying in the, um, the homeless shelter that was up there. Uh, because I know where to go and no money and whatever. Um, I got like three jobs the first week because if I'm not, I'm a lot of, I'm an, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, we can get some shit done. And when I decided I was going to fix my life, it was like a freight train. I, I got three jobs, I did, I, you know, I was like, I'm, I can do anything. And I did. And I, but I fell asleep at a meeting, and this lady hit me, and she's like, you don't do that here. And I'm like, ooh, she scared the shit out of me, won't be my sponsor. <laughs> and she did. And she walked me through the steps, and um, I did them. And I stuck around Alpina, and I started working at the treatment center. I was there five years as a technician. All the while, I'm going to meetings and learning about the steps. I struggled a lot. Um, Usually, I do open talks and I talk about what it's like for each step, but this time I was called to talk about some other things. And um, I can say this about my experience with working through the steps. I had a hard time with the whole God thing. Uh, I had to find my higher power in the principles, uh, in the good order and direction, or whatever they say. And, um, and that worked. It did. You start incorporating some honesty, hope, faith, uh, goodwill, all of those things in your daily living, and you do recover. And that had to be um, the people in the program want my higher power. Um, and I did amazing things. I stayed in the treatment, or I worked with people in treatment, I helped people, I gained some self esteem, I stay clean and sober. Um, I didn't want the women to keep getting out and going to the, um, they would go back to the same cycles and I would see it over and over again and they were scared to go to a homeless shelter and maybe their roles weren't that low yet or I don't know. And I was like, you know, maybe I'm not getting uh, sober again. And I did. And it was amazing. I was pretty proud of myself, which is probably a downfall. <laughs> but um, I was grateful to be able to help so many people. And I got to be in their lives, and, and my favorite thing about recovery is watching somebody come in the way I was in treatment with my blanket over my head and all miserable and hating myself, and then watch them come back to life like the, the, it comes back. And I, I thrived in that. And I had these amazing friends, and they were all in recovery. And my friends that I'd had my entire life were 
joined the program. They got sober too. I was like, what the hell? Life is good. Life is really good. And um, then uh, I got a call. I think it was. I should say this. I'm backtrack. I got to Alpina um, June first, uh, 2016. That's my sober day. Um, yeah, um, but I got a call. It would have been. Um, I don't even know what year it is. May 18, 2022. Um, I got well. My son did not. I tried. I got him in the treatment places. I knew people. Um, he stayed with them sometimes. Uh, I got a call that my son had been killed. And um, <coughs> mind you, like, he was the reason I got clean. He was not the reason I stayed clean. But he was my only child. He was my baby. And um, it knocked me on my ass. It completely knocked me on my ass. And I had recovery and I had an amazing support system. And I mean, the program enveloped me the people in it, um, and I did everything I was supposed to do. Um, it's, I haven't really been able to talk about this, you know, um, without getting really emotional or losing my train of thought um, or wanting to hide it, honestly, because that's my grief and that's my pain. And it was one of those things that I just, I was really protective of. Um, no mother should have to, my, the last time... I laid eyes on my son. It was in Louisville, Kentucky, and it was by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life to see him like that. And a friend drove me down there in the program, go figure. And I, I left the place in shock still and went to a meeting. And the thing about going to a meeting there was that it was inner city. And I felt so long, and I shared what had happened, and immediately everybody there had told me a story about somebody they had lost the same way in a violent act. And um, I felt the connectedness um, that we have in this program, like people are willing to share that with me. And after the meeting, a woman walked up to me, and she was like, she handed me this pamphlet. Mind you, I go to a lot of different programs. This one was um, a pamphlet on, um, the triangle of self-obsession. And she was like, you're living in anger, hatred, fear, or whatever. And I just, she just helped me lie, I cried. Um, the thing that I wanted to share about this experience, I had all the help in the world. And I found it in this program. But I started to develop resentments, too, about this program. I would go to meetings and um, women would be sharing about how obnoxious their kids were, and I'd be like, fuck you. You have a kid. But I wouldn't say that, and I'd sit there and I'd love them because that's what we do in the program. But I would be dying inside, and then they'd read the acceptance reading, and, which is my favorite chapter in the big book. Um, I know it's not like the big book technically is a story, but it made me feel welcome in the program because if you ever read, you know, acceptance is the answer. Uh, he had a lot of the same ailments that, that I did. Um, so I related to that. And, but people would be, nothing, absolutely, God, nothing happens in God's world by mistake. And I was stuck, like, fuck you. Mistakes happen. And this is a mistake. Um, and I held on to that. But luckily, the people that I had built my life around, the program that was there for me, did not leave my side, even through the ugly stuff. You know? And the best way I could describe it is that maybe my soul left my body. That's how it felt. Uh, when I look back at pictures of that time, like there was no light in my eyes. And um, the only thing that kept it tethered was the program and the people in it. And I still had this like good orderly direction, but I didn't have any of that like concept of higher power. Um, and I did everything that I could do to recover from the grief of losing my son. And I was not going to lose. I knew that. Because um, somebody had sent me, actually Trish, had sent me this um, open talk to listen to. It's uh, Sandy Beaches. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. Um, but he shared about losing his daughter the same way, violent act. Um, and he said, I immediately forgave. And I said, I didn't relate to this. 
But he did say that he immediately forgave because he knew that they, they, that person was too far from God. Okay? That I understood because I'd been there and I'd seen it. And um, Dominic was too far from God. He was not a violent person, but he was in that world. And when you get too far from God, bad things happen. Um, and I had to remember that, um, speaking of those principles. I carried that courage with me when I went to his sentencing. And I had to read to the judge the effect that it had on my life. And I was looking over at the person that had murdered my son. And he was too afraid to look at me. And I wasn't angry at this point because I had done some work. But I wanted him to see my pain. And short of like slapping, I couldn't get I couldn't get the man or young child really, he was I think twenty three, to look at me. And I'm standing there like bearing it off and, and I realized right then that I didn't need that. And that was something else I learned through working these steps like Everything I need is right here. And um, so is God. And it took me some healing. And I, and I had, like, literally had a Lieutenant Dan moment. <laughs> um, life got better. I was handling my gr grief. One of my friends asked me to officiate his wedding, and I did it. And then after the wedding, I walked into the water because there was so much love there. You know, it was a wedding, and there were children, and everybody. And it was so grateful. And I could feel God. And that's the thing. I feel everything. Um, but I can't hear or see things. I have to feel it. I, I, I prayed one other time to God, and I very rarely did that. I was in Mexico with Trisha, and I was praying to God because there was some shit happening. This is way before I lost my son. And um, I was like, God, you know, just be here with me, and blah, blah, blah. And I dipped my hand in the ocean. I pulled out a shell, and it said Isaiah something. I thought it said Isa because my name was Isa. Anyway, and it was like, do not fear, for I have you. And I was like, shell. You know. God was screaming in my face, and I still was like, somebody just wrote that on a shell and threw it in the ocean. <laughs> I didn't feel shit. Um, but... The, the the day that after that wedding and I lay in the water and said a prayer and asked God to be in my life and floated there and I heard all of these rocks and they sounded like wind chimes and I was like, There you are. I can feel you. You know? And and that's the thing, like it had taken me seven years to have a spiritual awakening. And unfortunately, God knows well not unfortunately, God knows that I need to feel something. And I felt as raw and raw and open and willing as I had ever felt in my life. And perfect time to make me feel a little bit more and enter into my heart. And I carry that with me everywhere I go. Um, I think that God is in the present moment. And there's no better way to be in the present moment than by expressing gratitude. So if I can be standing here and be like, man, I'm really grateful that Trisha has me this really uncomfortable thing. Maybe I can find God in that, you know. And um, I have more and more moments like that. I not, not always, but more and more. And the further I get along in that and the more I turn to God, the more, and I don't like to even say God, because I had a big chip on my shoulder about dogma when I came into this program. I was like, don't call God a him. Him scares me. You know, every man I've ever known have been really bad to me, so I don't want my God to look like that or be that. And all, it, all of it just turned my stomach inside out, and I was still trying to logic through a spiritual problem. And um, it took me a while to let that, got, that down to just drop it. And I still kind of pick it up because I am me, a human. So sometimes I'll get better and I'll choose not to get better. But as long as I don't use, 
I'll be fucking fine. And that's just how the program works, you know? And I hear more and more, and I see more and more. And as I stay connected spiritually and emotionally and physically, even, I mean, I have to take care of myself all the way around. It's holistic. There isn't a part of my life that I haven't been working on. Um, and as I do that and I grow, uh, more doors open. I was given this opportunity to work as a family recovery coach, which was a gift from God because I now get to stand there with the families. Not only am I an addict, alcoholic person in recovery, but I'm also a person who deeply loves addicts, alcoholics, and my family. And I grew up that way, and I think we all probably could if we looked at it that way. Um, one day I'll be in a hospital room with one of us on a ventilator talking to their husband or spouse or whomever, and that's a gift. The next day I'll be working with my teenagers, um, and they'll be crying, talking about how their parents in active addiction are hurting them. And I get to heal with them. I get to hold space and I get to let them know that they're loved. And I get to look at them and think there's still hope. Because it worked for me, you know? Um, and, and those are the gifts of my program. Um, it's not, in, what do they say? More will be revealed every day, every moment, really. Um, and I'm grateful. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.